Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. A um, few things I have to say. One is we personally are involved both as a lifestyle, a ketogenic diet, but also through my 16 years of clinical practice of what is effective. What do people need to take sometimes, all the time, to support their ketogenic diet? You'll get bits and pieces of this ongoing week after week. It's important to be comprehensive. In one way, it's simple. and one way, it's a little bit complicated. Hi, this is Carl, Dr. Goldcamp. I wanted to do a brief introduction to what you're about to hear. What you're about to hear is one of our coaching sessions, collective coaching sessions. As you know, I uh, keto coach, and I decided to do a group of 10 people. They went on down to about eight for two months. And so we have a group call once a week on Sundays at one o'clock, a Zoom session, so we can see each other and talk to each other. I have a topic to present for the week and then we check into how each person's doing. I get to see their progress via the uh, chronometer, which allows me to check in on their daily documentations of their what they're eating. And hopefully they were willing to document their glucose, take glucose readings, put that in there and their ketone readings after. I don't ask them to do ketone readings for the first month. Anyway, this is a session about week seven, I believe it was. We talk about the effect of exercise on blood sugar and why it's important and why they need to know that and visualize what's happening. And also then we go around and we check in from people that have all sorts of extraordinary situations. One athletic, one traveling internationally in Europe, the other down to Mexico, the other um, from very genetic diverse situation, I think. And that's a component. So anyway, what you're gonna hear are many voices, not just myself, I'm gonna go on initially and uh, talk, but you'll hear other people checking in. I hope you enjoy this. I think it's just a sharing of what it's like to be part of a coaching group. Enjoy. Uh, I'm really impressed that some people have really taken the bull by the horns and they've stayed with the tedium of logging all the data. I know it's boring. I know it's tedious, but you know, that's how it is to make a change in your life. And I think back to, um, you know, I have a bulletin board right in front of me. I'm in my room and I had up in the wall for the longest time. And I finally wrote a small post on it in the keto naturopath, which was, you can't talk about diet without talking about suicide. Pretty extreme reference, huh? Well, what I mean by that is that in this group, let's say, or in all of us, when we're trying to make a change, having that future image of what that change is we're trying to make. So for some, it's obviously weight loss. Uh, For others, it's uh, pregnancy and weight loss. Uh, For others, it's physical fitness. For others, it's clearly getting down their glucose levels to a, a healthy range. So it's the tie to that particular visual image of us in the future. You know, can we make it? And it's interesting, um, that some, start we've seen like a good friend of mine stopped after three days said it doesn't work it's like well i you know but we all have a perspective of can we hold that image is it important enough for us to go forward and so as time has moved on for all of us we're now at the end of six weeks i believe and that's a lot of time yeah that's a lot of time of logging away and putting in the putting in the uh, information without putting that information without doing that data to sort of say, yeah, I'm feeling pretty good. That's good for that. But there's a point in which we sort of, there we go, have to lock ourselves in to just do that boring work. And after that, we take the shackles off if that's what they're considered. And that's where we've learned that. So for instance, I was uh, tuning in to a a webinar on uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, but primarily it's about infertility. It's what women, and it's pretty much a pre-diabetes situation with women. So it goes into all the things I already knew. Yep, yep, yep. It's increase in testosterone and a decrease in estrogen for women. And, you know, how is that? And it's all driven by basically uh, blood sugar levels over time. What's the big secret to treat that? Well, you can do various medications, of course. Various basically anti-diabetic medications from metformin to things that are far worse. So there's this clinic down in Florida, and I'm sure there's clinics all over the place. And he's saying, you know, I've been treating uh, PCOS for 20 years, Without any medications, I've been using the ketogenic diet, and I threw in 20 years, it might be five, but he's been doing it more than a day. And I have great success. And so his success, his secret of the secret was, yeah, I just have my clients, which are women, do 20 carbs or less per day. That's it. 
So back to the tedium of logging these things in, it's, you know, obviously these women in that clinic paying him enough money to say, hey, this is important. Will you help me make it to this goal? He says, yeah, here we go. 20 grams of carbs per day or less, and we're good. And that reset them. Not in a day, not in a week, probably in a couple of months. My guess is uh, within six months, they were probably very uh, fertile. And so that's kind of an amazing story, not so much about the change, but about the simplicity of the change and the tedium implied of having to do that. So um, that's sort of my a step away from a tough love talk to say that you got to do the work to get the change. Having said that, um, you know, Kelly is, um, and there's a number of you, so I'll just start with Kelly. You know, Kelly is onto something. And so I don't have to get out the notebook to sort of say, what was Kelly's motivation? Actually, I'm just going to unmute you, Kelly. I'm not going to tell your story. You tell your story. I'll look at the data, but I think it's good to hear this story. Um, I mean, I guess my story is just, I had four kids back to back, um, pretty quickly. And after my last, I just was not able to lose any weight. Um, I stayed at my, basically at my nine month pregnancy weight for like two and a half years. Um, and I started exercising, doing CrossFit like a year ago and was feeling better. I had Let's see, I also have th low thyroid issues that kind of started um, in the middle of the pregnancies and so energy level issues and whatnot. And I had started CrossFit like a year ago and I felt better, but I wasn't losing any weight. So that was kind of like my motivation to start. I'm, you know, slowly and steadily losing some weight now. I'm feeling significantly better. And then workout wise, like I have a lot of athletic type goals and I'm actually like really seeing some major progress compared to how I was progressing since starting this diet. I feel better in general. I don't like I get sore, but I don't have pain that I was having in between workouts that I didn't like. I thought this was just how I felt. And I actually I feel so much better between workouts now. And um, I feel like. I'm gaining muscle. I'm definitely, I'm stronger. I'm able to lift more. I can do a rope climb now. Um, and those were all things like before starting the diet that weren't there. So it's been really great to see it with my workouts. That's cool. I'm going to mute you to explain some of what's going on in the background. Um, so the reason I asked, because Kelly's obviously doing it and she, you know, we, I can see all your logs because that's the point of using chronometer. And it is a pain. And so not everybody's perfect. They skip a day or it gets shorter and longer. Uh, but she's been working, you know, ballpark, pretty much within the parameters we've been using. And so why is it? So she as a person, as a woman, had four pregnancies, young in life. That's a good thing. It's a perfect time to have it. Uh, it's quite a, an effect on your metabolism for a long time afterwards. So women don't recover from it. And, but the fact that she had an athletic uh, predisposition, I mean, she had experience prior to pregnancies and going back to that and the fact that she's simply doing that now. So it's about exercise. This exercise is a big deal in terms of glucose and insulin. So when we hear, I'm going to make this simple, but it's a really important point because some people, you know, exercise is not required to lose weight on keto. However, exercise is a small miracle in and of itself. If you could bottle it, bottle it, drink it, bathe in it. It's, it's very important in this respect specifically now. So when we obviously work out, we need to burn energy. When we work out hard, you know, let's say even whether we're in keto, you know, in ketosis or we're burning sugar, it's pulling in whatever it needs. So if we're in ketosis, we're going to, which is fat burning. It doesn't say when we're in ketosis, it doesn't say to muscles, I'm sorry, today we're only getting fat because that's all I'm producing. It says here, use the fat first. And if you're going to go in high, you're still going to be running or working out, that then it's going to then start giving you some glucose. So your body says fat first, and it gives you a certain percentage of fat. When you exceed that, you want more, you're going to run faster, pull harder. Um, it will then start, you know, giving you glucose as well. So you're actually burning both. So why does that matter? The more you pull in the glucose in general, the more you are actually you know, taking that out, obviously, of circulation. So if one was slightly 
um, insulin resistance, which for the most part we all are. It's in, remember that uh, diagram I showed you of the five different levels and so on? We, we all, uh, that was the, the insulin. It sensitizes, it's a way of like, it's the demand. We're eating it, we're taking it out of circulation. Our glucose is dropping down to normal levels. That's why uh, not long distance athletes, um, not long distance carb eating athletes, uh, they actually can work themselves into diabetes. But if you're in ketosis and you are an endurance athlete or any sort of exercise, you are on a daily basis sensitizing yourself to glucose, to that amount that you need. Let me make it even simpler. You produce glucose either from your liver, like glucagon, we call it gluconeogenesis, or you take it in through your eating. So it's two sources come into the blood. All right. And so your insulin tends to regulate that. Your only demand... The thing that is really using glucose primarily is muscle, and then it's heart and a few other things, brain certainly, if that's all you're giving it, but it's being pulled in. So muscle is the one independent factor. When you rev it up, you're, you're increasing the demand, and because you're increasing the demand, you're sensitizing the, the uh, receptors of that cell, and that's where insulin comes in. And insulin is like a hotel, and when you go to check in, they give you that ticket, right, the, the uh, plastic card that unlocks your door. That's what insulin does. Unlocks the door so the glucose can go in. So by working out, you sensitize your, your cells to glucose. You actually lower your uh, insulin levels on a regular basis. So you really fine tune your metabolism. And um, the other thing is when Kelly was saying that she works out, she's feeling stronger and so on. Well, that will, that will happen with any workout, we know. But there's something unique with working out in keto is that you actually need to use less oxygen. So you get more lifts, if you will, you get more calories, which is a kind of an amazing thing. Once you start to adapt, you're, you're going to go much longer before you feel exhausted. And it's such an interesting thing to see. So this isn't an esoteric little conversation here. It applies to all of us. So whether you're going out for a long walk or whether you're going to the gym, whether you're doing CrossFit or, you know, high intensity uh, hit uh, workout with uh, just heavy weights or cardiovascular, they all fall into that same category of exercise. It's really important and it's a leg up. If one didn't or couldn't exercise, let's say they're wheelchair bound and went on to keto, clearly there's a lot of benefit. But I'm saying if you have that ability to work and exercise somehow into your life, it is it will pay you back in spades and speed up the whole process of what they call metabolic flexibility, going back and forth to uh, glucose, to uh, ketones, fat versus sugar. So that's very cool. I mean, I like that. Um, also, it's saying that, that Kelly did the work and she's like plodding along. So thanks, Kelly. And uh, she has her questions as it goes. And so it's nice to bang back things. What about this? What about that? I'm expecting to see videos of one-handed rope climb soon. <laughs> Right. Good. All right. So, Rishi, you, Rishi, you've been pretty much doing good documentation. What's your shoot from the hip, where you are, what you feel, what do you think's going on relative to keto and you? As a um, well, I haven't still fully recovered from that uh, heavy whipping cream. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still haven't gotten, I'm like one pound away from getting at my lowest point. And so last weekend I traveled and then I had to go to my dad's house to work and get in his health and market. And then I'm in Mexico now. So I always every day have my tea with the uh, C8 in it and stuff. Um, but it's just been hard to prepare and stuff like that. So I, I, I know that if I wasn't in this group, I would be completely like not even, I just be eating everything. So okay. it's, I know I'm a lot further along than I would be if I wasn't in the group, but I'm uh, definitely not doing well as others, I'm sure. It varies. And that's the other thing about doing any of this is to ignore others, but to hear good things. I mean, it's a filter. Can you elaborate on, I don't think everybody knows the story. Uh, I thought that was interesting because I know I got it as a, a personal message from you and I can't remember if it was shared in the group or not, but yeah. Can you elaborate on that? Because I think that was a very cool lesson. Oh, on the heavy whipping cream? Yep. Okay, so I've been trying to avoid uh, dairy um, for your suggestion. I still do have uh, butter in my tea just because I like how it tastes. So I thought, well, I'm probably one of the few is, that isn't affected by dairy, so I'm special. So I've been probably, I don't know, three or four weeks without 
really anything besides just some butter. And then I, which is really craving sweets. I didn't have any dark chocolate. So I mixed up some heavy whipping cream with stevia and, and kind of indulged. And I felt sick in my stomach. And the very next day, I weigh, I weigh myself every day. The next day, I put on five pounds, which I know is impossible to a lot of water. But um, it's, you know, took me all that time to lose five pounds and now, what, two weeks to try to get back to where I was. So yeah. definitely pretty big effect for me. Wow, that's a good lesson. I don't know if anybody else has shared that, but you know, dairy is such a bag. Uh, it's uh, we weightlifters look at it as good. You know, it actually the 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 whey will increase your insulin, um, the proteins there for your muscles, and they they totally endorse it. But it has estrogen and growth hormone, and uh, and that's just saying we're in the pretend world that they'd never had any antibiotics and so on and so forth. So it's a mixed bag. And I love the experiment because you were without and then had it. And then now you have to climb back down from that. And, and, and that's what I was hoping actually everybody else would get that should they go without dairy, even if this is the one time in their life, they're going to do it. Then when they add it back in, they already have the data to see what changes. So, Weight is such an, you know, weight and glucose, all these are nice, easy things to measure that change from. And once you do it uh, without and then add it in, you're going to have your data and go, wow, I didn't know it was that big of a deal. So even if you do nothing about it, at least now you know, which is a, a lot different than, as you should saying, I don't think it affects me. <laughs> right? yeah. Well, good for you. So while you're in Cabo, um, you're away. So how is keto while you're away? I mean, this is one of the classic questions of oh, what am I going to eat when I'm out I'm not home I don't have that personal control what are you doing for that um, so I you I don't know if you remember but I don't eat beef with pork too so I'm more picky than most people mm. um so I took a bag of macadamia nuts on the plane and I would, of course I always take my tea with me everywhere that's easy um I had uh food delivered to the room yesterday and we got in late which was good because otherwise I would have eaten whatever I could have decided to get hungry in the afternoon. Um, so I haven't like been eating perfectly, but I haven't eaten yet. So I usually don't eat until like lunch or a little bit later. Um, but I have eggs and um, turkey bacon and all that good stuff for when I'm ready to eat. And then I grab some pistachio nuts just from, I'm away from the room, something that doesn't spoil. Great, yeah. great. So you'd ask the question, um, that was, you said, what about, gee, I'm not, where'd your question go? Um, that, there you go. Um, can you explain the science behind losing hair? And I'll do that. Uh, maybe a little deeper on what happens to metabolism when you're low calorie, because you're feeling you don't have to eat as much. Is that correct? Yeah, and like what I'm traveling right now, it's, I just rather not eat anything than eat whatever I can grab. It seems like as soon as I eat something, I get more hungry. Yep. Yep. So that's a really good point. Um, some people go, oh my gosh, because they hit this spot in which I don't think I have to eat again. <laughs> you know, they think they're just going to disappear. And suddenly it's like, I lost my appetite. It must be some chemical. It's no longer in my body and I'm getting really unhealthy. No, you're not. Uh, I frankly, I think you sort of fall through a, a time machine and you come out, this is how people ate. You know, they didn't show up and have three meals a day. It was, they went by appetite. So now your appetite is going uh, in more and normal. So people do find that actually uh, without planning it, that they were very productive. They skipped a day. They had their water and so on and so forth. I mean, thirst is something that hopefully they're paying attention to. And uh, so they can skip a day. Whether it becomes a long-term pattern, it depends on, you know, that means your body is actually fat burning. There will come a time in which you have, when you've lost some of your weight, that you'll come back to, to normal, which does not mean you're eating three, three meals a day. It means you're probably having one or maybe a snack and one. And it would drive itself. So it's less academic and more of a natural progression. But when you come away from, gosh, I had three meals a day and I'm not even quite feeling I even have to eat today. Um, that's what I love, especially when it comes to traveling. You know, you're stuck in airports and so on. You just sit down and read a book, you know, get it coffee or tea or whatever. And, um, that's all you need. And you're, you're kind of surprised. You're not driven to have to get food at the next stop. So I, I would say that's not a problem. Um, we'll watch you. I don't think you'll disappear to a, a small little ant of a person because you've lost all your weight. 
<laughs> but it will come it will come back uh, and and I'm glad you're there and uh, I hear that again and again it was I got this view though can you see that ah uh, nice absolutely <laughs> no it's a nice place to be yeah great, great marlin fishing from what I hear and good diving scuba diving that is well good so Emmy good to hear speaking of another um another international are you still in Germany you got home a couple days ago Oh, nice. So you, it's a repeat question for you. So what you do? It must be hard to stay on keto when you're like doing international travel and all the delicacies are. It was me, my husband, and I have two kids, and then my brother and his daughters, we all went. And I'm the only one who eats keto. So that's always fun. Um, so I pretty much ate eggs, bacon, and avocado for breakfast every day. And then for dinner, I would have a cheeseburger without the bun, like. Because everybody else is wanting burgers and pizza, and I'm like, most places all have cheeseburgers, so that was wow. like it every day. I bring so, my nuts with, um, you know, so I can have them on the plane, but because that's a long flight. Absolutely. So, what do you feel about that experience behind you? Did you feel you had to be antisocial, or no. was it? No, no okay. I went. Yeah, we did. We did everything together. I went to the restaurants with them. Like, they all know that I do it. Um, Nobody gives me any hard, a hard time or anything. In the restaurant, sometimes I don't tell them no bun just because I feel like they're going to look at me funny. So I just take it off myself. And we were at a hard rock cafe in Berlin. And the, the waitress actually came over because she couldn't tell that I had actually eaten the, the meat and not the bun. And she came over and she's like, is everything okay with your burger? <laughs> oh, I ate it. That's just the bread. Very good. Very good. Do you ever ask for extra servings of butter? I don't, or, I, I've never put butter on my burger, so I would okay. eat the burger and then have some macadamia nuts to try to make up the extra fat that I didn't gotcha. get. Good. Uh, because my protein isn't very high. So I, if I have bacon and eggs for breakfast, and then I have some kind right. of meat, like either a burger or a steak, I can't have very much because then I'd go over my protein. Right. So, Good like, for so you. Then I try to um, have something because I can't just eat butter and like, I would never do that stuff. So I'm like, how can I get in fats without adding a lot of protein? And usually it's just, I, I can have 12 macadamia nuts and that's my ounce of macadamia nuts. <laughs> is, um, what is your maiden name? Your last maiden name? What is your? Allgauer. Is that German? Yes. Ah, I face that's half my family as well. And there's this kind of, you can pick them out of a crowd. These people are that, when you're down to counting macadamia nuts, you know, there's a ethnic orientation to that, that I bet they're German. But anyway, yeah. they're here, they're there. good for you. These are good stories. Go ahead. I, I did eat more than I know I should have, but I think it was the steroids that I was on that made me eat, like be more hungry. Yeah. So normally I, I try to fast like 18 hours a day. So, in Germany, I did eat breakfast at breakfast time with everybody else instead of later in the day. Mm -hmm. But then we didn't have dinner, which I normally eat my dinner at three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and then I fast until like 10, 11, sometimes 12 the next day. But mm -hmm. in Germany, my schedule was all thrown off because, you know, we would all eat together. So there were times I didn't have dinner until nine o'clock at night. <laughs> nice. You know, it's, it provides a flexibility. We're in an imperfect world, you know, that just go with it. I just like that. And do you feel that you have that sort of inflex? You're, you're not flexible. It's like, all right. For the, for the most part, I'm good. Um, like the last few days, because I'm not on the steroids anymore. Um, I'm trying to get my ketone levels to go back up and, you know, cause it was all kinds of crazy with the medication they had me on. And I'm afraid that when I go back to the doctor tomorrow, he's going to want to put me on some more. Um, because I, so a year ago, I was diagnosed with blastomycosis. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I'd probably had it for three months before I even went to the doctor. Right. Because I'll admit, I'm a smoker. I've smoked since I was 12. Um, I, I can hear that, by the way. Yeah. And I've had, I, I have, um, since I was a kid, I have exercise induced asthma. So it's really hard for me to breathe. And so when I first ha started having chest pain, I just thought it was my asthma getting worse. And I would use my mm -hmm. inhaler. And then I, I finally went to the doctor and they did all these biopsies and all these other, you know, they like washed my lungs. I don't remember what that's called, where they, you know, yeah. and whatever. And then it finally came out that I had blastomycosis. No idea where I got it from. Like nobody knows. So I took medication for like nine months and 
they keep telling me that it's still there when they do the x-rays, that the stuff is still in my chest, but I don't need the medication anymore. Um, and that it'll, it'll eventually get better. But yet I, it's gotten so bad and it's not, it's kind of embarrassing, but most days I can't wear a bra. Like just to have it around my, my wrist. Yeah. yeah. So that was why I finally went to the emergency room the day before we left for Germany. Cause I'm like, I have to wear a bra to go out in public. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not small chested. So to be in public, I have to wear a bra and I'm like, what am I going to do? So they, they put me on steroids, which really did help. Like, so there were some days that I didn't have to take the painkillers mm -hmm. and the muscle relaxers, but the steroids helped with the inflammation, I guess. I, I don't know, but Excellent. it did help me manage. <laughs> here's a, here's a few, uh, you hit a couple of uh, hot buttons to talk about. One is just the interest of the blastomycosis. It, that is a fungal infection. It is actually regionally, and it's kind of the central of the country. I mean, as part of the South, and um, there is so it's it's one of these things. It's kind of your part of the country, and apparently, it's unique, even more unique. There's a certain type, and I guess the the pinnacle of all this is I forget was it Illinois you live in or Indi is it Illinois? And Illinois has the highest incident of that. So it's around. Uh, there's also when I went down south, I went into a cave that said, you know, we don't let tourists go back beyond this point anymore because the bats now have this big fungal infection and the bats populations of, and there's a correlation, these two. And so I came back with this, you know, first time I was sick for uh, a couple of weeks, but it was all in my nose. And uh, uh, it was kind of embarrassing because my nose actually swell, swelled up and I thought maybe it was Lyme disease. And I realized this is probably what it was. And uh, so it's out there. So it hit you. Uh, you were probably uh, an open victim given your history of smoking and then asthma was secondary to that. But the idea of steroids, uh, steroids are a really interesting topic because it has to do with stress. You know, we, steroids is obviously a medication given it's an anti-inflammatory. And uh, we also make that cortisol. And so cortisol is a, I was talking to somebody else in a one-to-one -one or something. And I said, think of cortisol as eating a donut in terms of blood sugar, because it is saying whether you're generating this yourself, you know, you're stressed because there is a bear chasing you and you're running for your life. That's a high cortisol, you know, and it's going to spew out as much sugar as possible to have the whole body and all your muscles work at peak velocity. Right. Um, so that's why it exists. So now we have it as a medication. So we induce stress in essence. That's what steroids are. Uh, when people have a lot of steroids, they get kind of moon faced. You know, that's a what they call cushionoid. That's it's actually a condition of too much steroid. But we all get that, and that will pass when you're taken off. But it does drive your point about I get hungry perhaps after I get the steroids. Absolutely. So it's like eating the donut. Now, literally, I've eaten my steroids. I've eaten my donut. I drove my blood sugar up. When my blood sugar is up, then it drives a carbohydrate appetite. I want more blood sugar to function here. Um, usually that's resolved maybe with more steroids down the road, but it absolutely is a correlation. It, it, there is an appetite to steroids, post-steroids use. It will change, and you got to do what you got to do. But um, good for you, soldiering on. And uh, I'm glad you survived Europe. Okay, Krista. Okay. So give me an update. What I, the, what I like about what you've been doing, you've been one of the soldiers for lack of a better reference, uh, plotting along and documenting, you know, and I, I like going to, I mean, it, it's, it gives me something to talk about. It gives me, um, you know, I, I, I don't have to agree or disagree, but when we do the work, but anyways, I wanted to applaud you for doing that because it is, you've come from a, my perspective of where you started from was this is awkward. I'm not quite sure if I can do this, but you sort of just buttoned it up and, um, and did it. And I, I'm, I'm just impressed with that soldiering on because there's so much boredom up front and that novelty change is both difficult and kind of stultifying in a way. Yeah, definitely. It, um, I think, dairy free was really, really, really hard for me. Um, I, I think it was really hard for me to navigate with, um, because I'd done it in, you know, keto in the past, but I'd never had, I'd never done dairy free keto. And I think that my, in the past, when I was doing recipe creations and eating, um, it was a lot of, a lot of dairy. 
So when I started this, it was actually really, really hard and very awkward for me because I didn't, I didn't know how to eat and I had to kind of rebuild that skill set. So it was very awkward and really frustrating, but I think I, I, I figured it out. No, I think you did. And, you know, it's like, there's so many paths to do this. You know, we all have the macros now memorized, right? We went through all that. That's kind of the elementary school of, of going keto. But so here's what I look at. And I, I, I appreciate what you did yesterday. And so, yes, my eye goes to where are your ketones? You're clearly in ketosis, kiddo. You know, it's to be envied by, by most. You know, that means you're, you're on a healthy road. And I feel relieved. If there was a number that I could tell everybody to reach, and I, I don't do this, I, I do not tell this to people because I don't want them to feel they're not doing well. But we uh, okay, the ideal glucose number is right around 85. So when I see somebody like Krista, you know, these are great numbers to have. That I have no worry that that all we're going to be doing in the future, or all that she's going to be doing in the future, is going to be probably dropping her fat, not a lot, but dropping her fat because she's already has her fat. Like we all have our own endogenous fat. So she's going from, if you will, exogenous, eating her fat to burning her fat. And that is such a healthy transition because it's the first step I really needed to have everybody get into is like get into ketosis and then we can play and we can do all these variations. And so I feel very safe, Krista, with you. And I, I think your numbers, I know you want to drop weight and you have dropped weight. Um, I think now we have a safety factor in there and we can, per your appetite, uh, not so much per your discipline, but you can play with dropping, you know, that's a good, you know, half your fat that's, I'm fine with that. And you, and you can play, play it by ear. These numbers will dictate how necessary this fat is. So if you're even dropping your fat more and we can, you know, keep these glucose numbers and keep, if you're, ketones go down to one and two, one, anything above one is 1.5 is kind of where I'd like everybody to be at a low level. I can argue that you're in ketosis at 0.6, but I like 1.5. So you have a big buffer there. I don't think you will change that at all by burning your own fat. So you have a lot to play with. And I think your challenge will be making this interesting. You know, I mean, per you, I mean, I, I can live on plywood for a year, so I'm not a person that's driven by having being interesting. Other things have to be interesting in my life. But I get the sense that you need to have a good variety and that will be your challenge. But these numbers are, are beautiful, kiddo. They're beautiful. Yeah, and, yeah, I agree. That variety, it, and it's so tricky because I don't, I'm, I'm sometimes scared to try new things. Um, but I need to, I think I stick with what's safe sometimes. And I, I think that you're right you know, in, in order to make sure this is long term, I need to kind of, I need to branch out a little bit more and try, you know, keto pancakes and other, other things. That's true. You know, the, the reason that, you know, in one way, when Junie and I talk about, you know, how can we develop this? It's been at a level that it has to be real, you know, or I you have no big plans of coming out of book here or there. I mean, there'd be smaller plans or some book that's really going to be helpful, but keeping it real so people can do. So her pancakes are actually a big deal for a lot of people. I went down and had one this afternoon because I'm trying to make it work towards a crepe level things where I can, you know, roll in salmon or something, you know, my way of what I like to eat. But having these little fallback things that, that make life interesting and your food interesting is key for you. You know, and if that's what you need, go for it. The mayo was a real leg up when we kind of put that together. Suddenly our world got brighter and a lot of other things we could use that for. And then Judy was, you know, for like she could substitute mayo for was it sour cream or something that it suddenly it got to be all these other things that people could do. Um, but that's the trick, you know, having the, the short and sweet to do the making the things ahead of time. I think that was, I've read so many uh, of the chronometers and notes that I've gotten that I think it was uh, Risha that made her bacon, whatever, or made some of the, the food that she was going to eat in the morning so she could take it with you. That's something. That's another skill. And if it's not you, Risha, sorry. Um, it's a skill about saying a little preparation goes a heck of a long way and keeps you out of trouble. But um, I, I'm so pleased with your numbers that now it's more working on something that's a little more personality driven. But if you can keep doing this and you log away and you look at these numbers, you have great freedom here now. You know, um, 
and let me, any other comments? Because I just, I just love the work that you're doing. It speaks volumes of who you are, if you ask me. Thanks. Okay. I'm going to, Irma was going to be on because I think she's a, a, a good example. So I'm just going to switch to her uh, chronometer because um, she also is in Mexico for, I think, diff different reasons since came back. That as we've talked publicly about everybody's uh, situation, hers are about blood sugar and keeping these levels consistently low. And, um, and so for that, you know, I would say if there was about five days, she didn't document anything. And I don't know um, how good or bad that worked out for her, but I, I, uh, she's PM me a few times and my feelings are, I believe she came back. So you see the days that she didn't do it here. She started, let's go here. That my concern is she never completely get, Hey, Irma's there. Irma, I'm going to be talking about you. Perfect timing. Okay. Hi. Great. Hi. I was just going to do, I told people you're going to be late and I was just going to start talking about you because we all had different situations. We came in and I was going to say that, you know, you, you left for a while to go down to Mexico and came back and we all have different concerns. Yours was about blood sugar, you know, and uh, we all pretty much knew that. And you had some fairly decent numbers, but um, we're kind of the theme of my review is the tedium of documentation and how important it is initially, initially being the first four weeks, of course, but certainly then these two months. And going away and coming back is difficult. And I wanted you to elaborate on, remember your, your personal message you sent me, you said, wait a minute, all this fat's gonna clog my arteries. So tell me about your, those are, those are kind of, those are big fears that, it, tell me, you know, speak from your heart about, I go, wow, she must've talked to somebody. <laughs> right? And what are your thoughts there? Because I feel obligated to alleviate your anxiety in that regard. Well, I, I guess um, I wasn't myself stressed because I, I uh, believe, you know, uh, I've been reading and I feel, I see the results. So it's really more like I felt defenseless against other people telling me like I, I didn't have an answer to defend what I was eating. So uh, in that moment, I realized my ignorance of like, I'm doing this, but I don't know why. I know that it works and I know I felt better. And I'm ecstatic that I feel in control about my diabetes. But, you know, when you have my cousin who is an RN telling me, what are you doing eating all that butter? It's going to clog your arteries. Like I didn't have a fast and easy answer to defend myself. And mm -hmm. uh, not that it didn't stop me. I still ate my butter, but you know, it, 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 I think that we're still in the minority, you know, and you will get those looks and faces and, and then, and those questions asked. And I, I believe for me, at least it's important to, to be knowledgeable which you should be, I guess, because I um, shouldn't just take it at face, you know, what you say, Dr. Carl, because I do take whatever you say at face. I believe mm -hmm. you 100%. Um, but it does help to have, a, a, you know, fast and quick and easy answer for when you get those, those concerns. Because they are concerns. They love you. They're not being mean. Uh, but, you know, it does help to have a fast and easy answer. Okay, let me pause you there because I think that's excellent. I, I love hearing that. Um, I wish more people had fears because I had more to talk about <laughs> or not fears, uh, comments like that. So I'm going to mute you for a second and then I'm going to talk and then bring you back on. So about that, there's a couple things I want to say. And if you're like me, reading is a big deal. And so I would say, first of all, in the naturopath, the keto naturopath uh, group in the file section, there's a number of books you can read and uh Ellen Davis, I like all her books. You have obviously Jeff Bullock and Steve Finney. They are towering names in the field of the ketogenic diet. Um, they were the first books that I read, and one is called The Art and Science of Low Carb Eating. Just that was the very first book. You read that. Uh, that will be a good start. There's also Dr. Fung. Uh, we've listed his books there. He's uh, up in Toronto, and he's actually a um, nephrologist, a kidney doctor, but his practice has exploded because. He now has, has a fasting center. He's kind of a specialist on fasting. That's what his, one of his nurses kind of does. Um, and he's written three books. One is The Obesity Code, which is very, very good. Uh, they have the complete book of fasting and then one on diabetes. So it's a readable book without being too technical. So both of those are good. And there's 
other books coming out all over the place. But I say, if you chose any one book, probably the obesity code may, might be the most compatible to read that you'll get it. It's sort of the same message in different contexts. You know, it's, so the message isn't going to change. There's not going to be one more little thing you're going to do. Keto is keto. But so that's, that's where you can go for references. And I do believe all of us, let's say you get remarkable changes and it all happens. And you go, why did this just happen? You're still going to want to know why did this happen? And uh, in this group, even though I give little nuggets of why some of these things happen, it was all about implementation. I want people to have the results and they go, Shazam, what just happened to me? Well, then they're going to be motivated to go back and read. But if I put too much info up front and they don't get the results, they're going to say, well, who cares? You know, so that was my priority about implementation over uh, explanation. And I think explanation is, gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And there's a conference going on uh, with Doug Reynolds over in San Diego, the low carb USA. It was also on the East coast. It's, they're just excellent places to jump in and you go, Oh my gosh, I just fell into a colony of people that are all doing this doctors included and you get converted, but start on your own. But the other thing is, and what you've really sort of opened up, which is excellent is that, Oh my gosh, we're now doing this adventure with, with ourselves and whether it's our family, who obviously loves us, we hope, or our friends, or then we get to those outer circles of people that are less caring about us and more just questioning what our behavior is, it's a vulnerable place to be, not so much just in terms of lack of information, but vulnerable place to be because we're getting results, our life is changing, we don't have the right answers, and it pulls us back a little bit, you know, and it makes us question what we're doing. And... Uh, it's hard. It's, so it's a hard place to be, to be the pioneer in your context, in your group, um, let alone maybe a culture. I'm generalizing now um, Central America being pretty high carb and high fruit. But that's the way it goes. It's a truth worldwide. And, and it's now going to be no matter where you are in the world, you're going to get the same truth. So it's not going to be, it's not an American truth. It's not a South African truth. It's not a German truth. It's just coming in from all corners of the world. On a podcast I did with Doug Reynolds, who's he and his wife is running that conference. They're doing a conference in Indonesia. He, he originally was from South Africa, now lives in Australia. And I said, Indonesia? Because I had lived there for a few years in the oil field back in a former life. I said, I don't quite see Indonesia as being aware of a ketogenic diet. You know, it was 1% were doing financially well and everybody else was poor and they were high carbs and high fruit, pretty much like Central America. Um, and he said, well, you know, that's true. Actually, it was an engineer that reached out to him that, you know, because they're, they're educated too. You know, they've gone to college, wherever it is internationally, but they come back home. And he said, no, as he and his engineer friends are starting a conference. And Doug himself is an engineer. So the reason I say that, it's not all doctors and patients are the only ones working on this. There's actually a lot of software people have come in and done their own labs and saying, oh my gosh, you know, why is this happening? What's happening here? And so it's coming from so many different places. It's no longer just a medical issue. This is Judy. I'm just giving you my story. I, I, do, I do have my story in the file section, but the fats that you eat do not clog your arteries. It is more the carbohydrates and the sugar you eat with the fats that will. And there are a lot of studies. There are a lot of there's a lot of documentation out there. And I do think everybody does need to read the obesity code. And I'll put a link in the, the group with that. And also the art and science of low carbohydrate living. I'll do that as well. But just my personal story is two years ago. Uh, I had my yearly blood test done and my total cholesterol was 411. And my normal cholesterol before was always around 200. And nobody was ever concerned because I had really low triglycerides and high HDL until I moved to where we are now. And of course, the doctor I went to, my my cholesterol was like 200 and she all you know wanted to put me on statins which one I will never go on a statin because there's a higher correlation with statins and diabetes and dementia than there is with statins um, preventing heart disease so I was a little freaked out at 411 that really bothered me because one my father had a triple bypass when he was in his early 70s and I thought oh goodness 
I, I'm, I'm in trouble. You know, we happened to go to a couple of keto conferences a few days after. Of course, I talked to every single doctor there, showed them my blood work since I had it, you know, and, and they all looked at my low triglycerides and high HDL and said, you don't have a problem. So there are a few tests that you can take. If you do end up getting a cholesterol test that's high and your doctor says statin, statin, before you do anything, there are more tests for you to take. And one is an NMR test, which tells you the particle size. If you got light, fluffy cholesterol particles, you're OK. It's the small, dense ones that are a problem. And I had particle size A, which is the light fluffy particles. That wasn't enough for me, so I had the scan of my carotid arteries. It's an ultrasound. And I'm perfect. I have no blockages in my carotid arteries. So just to have the most definitive test, which is the heart calcium. CAC, coronary calcium. Coronary, scan. it was the heart calcium score test, which is an, it's a CAT scan. So I had that done, and perfect. So here I have total cholesterol of 411. My doctor is freaking out. She has to document that I'm saying, no, I'm not going on statins because one, statins don't work. They cause you more problems. And I don't have any problems. I'm eating fat. I have a lot of cholesterol in my body, but there is no blockages. There's no calcium buildup. I'm perfect. And for women over 60, and I'm not going to tell you that I'm a woman over 60, but the higher cholesterol that you have, the healthier you are. So a lot of this cholesterol stuff and saturated fat stuff was based on a flawed research paper that the guy who did it actually even admitted it was flawed. That's Ansel Keys. So, Can I? Ansel Keys. Yeah. So... So there is a lot of documentation out there, and some of the worst people are nurses and doctors who don't keep up to date on research. So okay, I can interrupt. It's like uh, there's lessons behind this. So not only did Judy take her labs down to these two uh, keto conferences, both down in Florida, so they're like three weeks apart, you know, and she chases down the various speakers. You know, are more than happy to have a person with real labs show up and saying, you know, here. Um, and, and Judy's uh, a shorter person. And usually he's towering people. So these, these images are, I'll help you, little lady. You know, and she, had, she must have had, you know, all the experts, I don't know about in the world, but a lot of them going over this. So with that, she comes back. And this is before she had her, her coronary uh, artery scan, her carotid artery scan, and her NMR. NMR. So these are the three tests had yet to be done. So she had the task of making an appointment with her. Actually, we're in Cape Cod, so it's a nurse practitioner who calls most of the shots. They have a lot of autonomy out here that she had to, in essence, educate her, uh, the nurse practitioner, who is, it's, you know, it's, it's rare to find this, that yes, I'll endorse that test, but I won't take offense that you're telling me this. And so I thought that was a, a big uh, reach for her and I I had yet to have uh, some of those tests done and so I basically followed suit we had to pay out of pocket for both the uh, no, carotid... we just, no we just had to pay out of pocket for the CT scan out. okay okay and um, so yeah she had actually better scores than myself we both had nothing for the carotid but back to athleticism we find a lot of people I used to do a lot of triathlons in one marathon when you do these sustained you know, uh, cardiovascular exercises, it actually is hard, especially back in those pro-carb days, um, it, it tends to uh, work on your heart. So you even have people like Mark Sisson and so on and so forth that they actually have impaired hearts because of all their athleticism prior to. So anyway, so that was, a, a, that was an issue of learning, going to the conferences, taking that information and applying it and making a bigger decision. And a reference to the higher cholesterol being protective of women over 60 is actually a Norwegian study that they couldn't find an upper limit. You know, they, they picked a number, which is 300 and said, we'll just go to 300 and see what all cause mortality is associated with. And they couldn't find any 
<laughs> associated with 300. So they're going to have to redo that to 400 and 500. So that's interesting. So all this is being debunked. But I, back to Irma's comment when somebody says, high fat is clogging my arteries. One of my biggest fears about keto, people starting keto, is they hear it is, you know, um, high fat. They, they heard that. That's somehow stuck in their mind but they didn't want to give up their carbs. So if they already were on a fairly high carb diet and they add in the high fats, that's disastrous. That, that's the combination you don't want at all. And that will be a problem. And that basically is the standard American diet. That's what it was before. And so you, know, you sort of have to say, that's the one combination you do not want, high carbs, high fat. And so the low carb and the high fat is a whole different thing. And that is the phenomena the low carb, meaning the low blood sugars, now we're talking about, now we've talked about 85 is a good number, and maybe the average is going to start falling down. Once we've pick, taken that out, taken, taken out the higher averages of blood sugars that have been caused normal, and it, when you go to a lab, by the way, the lab, whether it's Detroit or pick the city, it's Detroit. They have the averages for all the numbers of all the people that had their lab done. At, so they have a lab average, not a national average, not a state average, but the lab average. And it varies as you go around the country. Um, a big lab, so will have a bigger population base to draw those averages from. So these averages have been parenthetically called normal. And so they are on a high carb normals. And so now we're going into this new world as Irma said again, that you know, there's not many of us in this world. Uh, that, you know, when you go to the conference, you think the whole world's in your conference. Um, but when you drop the carbs down on a regular basis, all the other lab normals, thyroid included, certainly cholesterol, change. And these other numbers are now being questioned, what was normal? What is normal? And, and so that's the edge that we're at. We no longer have a packet of all these normal blood levels. Uh, we were talking a little bit uh, to Stacy <laughs> earlier about um, thyroid and and what happens when people go on um, keto is their thyroid actual thyroid hormone the T3 and T4 lowers a little bit but their thyroid TSH thyroid stimulating hormone which is what everybody measures first if you're hypothyroid or not does not change so is that a question of it's a problem or is that a question of a healthy change nobody knows and some docs that are supporting a ketogenic diet, they're a little scared at this new territory, unless there's a patient that says, I feel tired and sluggish and I can't, you know, all the hypothyroid kind of symptoms. They don't have the symptoms, they won't treat them, but there's a bunch of people, more than a bunch of people that actually have low thyroid hormone doing quite fine. And they're figuring that it is much more efficient to burn fat than it is to burn glucose. You have lower oxidation and lower free radicals. And so maybe that's a healthier thing. So that's an example of these changes of these labs and Judy's trial and error of realizing, wow, these high numbers are scary. I've never been this high before. And then realizing, wait a minute, all the good numbers are incredibly good. And she, the onus fell on her to, to educate her docs. And luckily she found somebody who wasn't going to take offense to having her do these labs. So I think I'm going to, leave that there. We've covered a lot of ground. Um, you know, in one way, I don't want to over-talk keto, but I, oh, actually, I didn't answer uh, Rishi's questions way back about hair loss, and that's important. Uh, hair loss is basically, it happens and it, it's not permanent. It, you don't go bald, um, but it's indicative about weight loss. As you lose weight, for you, men and or women, so if you were heavier and you lost weight, those are the people that tend to, not 100%, but of those who report um, hair loss, it's because they have dropped weight. And so you'll hear that story. And when you stabilize, uh, the hair goes through cycling. And actually, we're all losing hair, as we know. Check your comb in the morning. Um, but it's, it's on its own cycle, and all hair follicles are on a different cycle. So it's all kind of like you know, the woods. Not all the trees were born at the same time, right? So that's the reason for, and you can go into deeper why is that, but it's the highest and the most easiest correlation to make is in dropping weight, if it's a significant amount of weight, um, and quickly dropping, quickly varies per person, uh, is associated with uh, hair loss. 
uh, and that's about it. It's not so much, it's, some people can, well, my, if my iron drops down, I, that's true too, but if you're not anemic and if you're eating um, your proteins and so on, that's seldom the case uh, in the course of keto that one is uh, losing hair loss due to a nutrient deficiency. It's usually because they've dropped weight. So good news, bad news, but it will come back. And, and it doesn't last forever. I, I lost, it did freak me out at, at one point, the amount of hair I was losing, but when I stopped losing it and, and everything's fine now. So you, you asked, a, your other question was kind of a bigger, longer one, going deeper to meta metabolic changes due to keto. One is you have a more sustained energy. That means you don't come to these abrupt places of, I just got exhausted. I'm going to, I need to eat something. That sort of ravenous appetite that happens when we're on carbs. Um, you'll feel that you're hungry, but even hunger passes. You know, you go, oh, I'm so, sort of hungry. And then if you forget about it because you're busy someplace, you go, gosh, I was hungry five hours ago and I forgot to eat. Well, if you're burning glucose and you're on carbs, you don't forget to eat. You'll eat the table because you're so hungry. Um, so that's one thing. So basically you have sustained energy um, throughout the day, even when it's low. It's not that you won't get hungry. It's just it won't hit to the sort of um, ravenous points that you become, as they say, hangry, hungry and angry at the same time. Okay. The other thing is uh, more in Kelly's corner of the world in terms of athleticism, and it's really phenomenal. It's that you get more, you get fewer, fewer, fewer free radicals. So you have less inflammation. Um, it's, that's sort of a general uh, claim, which is true for everybody. And you get more work output for oxygen you that you need. So you get less winded or you can go longer before you get winded. And so it, it applies to everything. So it applies to your work day. It applies to actually literally working out, whether it's, you know, you're measuring how many lifts I had to do and you can actually calculate down the, the calories that it took. And you go, wow, I just got another couple hundred calories before I got tired or a thousand calories before I got tired. So that's an actual thing that happens. You're consuming less oxygen because you need less oxygen to burn fat than you do water. What else would I say in terms of metabolism? I would probably leave it at that for the, the major things that usually, in terms of inflammation, this is such a big thing. You can go really technical into this, which I'm not going to. I know I just said, I said fewer free radicals, but inflammation just drops. And they don't, you can't, you can't go to, the whole world and say, gosh, I don't get colds and flus, but people claim that. I mean, it hasn't been, there's not a study that says people on keto have fewer colds and flus. Keto is so new, these kind of studies just have not been done. So it's more like anecdotal and people are talking to each other. I will certainly claim that, um, except for that fungal thing that I caught in some cave in North Carolina. I hadn't been sick for, I would say, four or five years. And so I, it's a real thing. And then when you go to some of these conferences, should any of you go, you're going to get a smattering of medical and a smattering of some just sort of common people getting up and saying, I have extreme health change. But there's a whole pathway that opens up because of keto that's very anti-inflammatory. How you will see it on your labs is that your CRP will drop like a stone. Most of you are probably two, threes, fours. You'll probably be one half to zero, but very low. You'll be, uh, do I use the word chronics? you'll be consistently low. And that's a big deal. So in terms of Emmy, let's say, it'd be interesting to see relative to history of smoker and asthma, that will drop down. Asthma is, it, you know, they have a thing called COPD, cardio obstructive pulmonary disease. And it's a big category of a lot of things. Asthma is in there, but asthma is one that can be changed. You know, it's, you're not, you haven't ruined part of your lung, you know, you haven't. Uh, and so the degree that inflammation drops down, I'm not talking about steroids now, naturally drops down, you're gonna find the breathing's gonna come easier or the incidences of asthma will decrease. Same, same, it's, that's how it manifests in, that, in your context. Well, good, I hope you all had some good take homes today and uh, keep doing the work. I, I like the questions, obviously, but even the incidentals like Irma's stories led a lot deeper than you'd than you'd believe, but just doing the work, things will get better. I'm watching your numbers. I appreciate the fact that you're, you know, you're giving me some readings every so often. I get to sort of, you know, feel relieved like with Krista and saying, you know, keep on going. You know, now we can play with some serious numbers or you can play with some serious numbers and I'll look over your shoulder. That's, that's a big deal. 
absolutely a big deal. Uh, I would be worried in a medical, uh, had I not had this experience and you walked into my practice and you said, I'm just going to start fasting. I'm thinking, well, lady, lady, <laughs> you know, you're a medical liability here. I don't feel that. Uh, not your doctor now, but I don't feel there's that anxiety. Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp again for a brief reminder of something I completely forget to do at the end of every episode. You've heard me talk long enough on many different episodes, but what I would love you to do, and many of you have already done this, I just want to reinforce this particular behavior, which is to send me your questions. Send me your questions and anything you have about keto. If there's something that I don't know, I will look it up. And if it's something that intrigues me, I will probably make an episode uh, a podcast about that particular topic. So what you need to do is to send me your questions at drgoldcamp at ketonaturopath.com. So that's D-R-G-O-L-D-K-A-M-P at K-E-T-O-N-A-T-U-R-O-P-A-T-H.com. Goldcamp at ketonaturopath.com. Feel free to join our Facebook group, which is also ketonaturopath.com. That's been growing lately. You also have to answer a questionnaire should you cho- choose to join. And I don't ask for your email. I ask that you follow our terms. I try to avoid uh, advertising and uh, the obvious interruptions of a, just a good Facebook group. So hope to see you at one place or other. Please send me your questions and uh, look forward to talking to you and getting to know you. Take care. Thanks for listening. For anybody who has any questions, feel free to contact me on our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath. Same name as our podcast. I'm open to any questions and we plod through the good and the bad, the difficult and the easy week after week.